Îmi face plăcere să vă spun bun venit la o nouă ediție a emisiunii Punctul de plecare. Mă consider extrem de privilegiat să corespondesc cu oameni remarcabili în pregătirea pentru interviuri, să am aceste conversații pasionante, să urmăresc traducerea și pregătirea pentru emisie și chiar să înregistrez aceste introduceri. Viața mea spirituală, orizontul meu intelectual, trăirile mele sufletești sunt îmbogățite și înnobilate, așa cum cred că și dumneavoastră aveți de fiecare dată aceeași experiență. Invitatul meu de astăzi, dr. David Trim, este un istoric reputat, autor și editor al unor publicații istorice de ținută. După o carieră în cercetare și ca profesor la Newbold College în Anglia, dr. Trim a fost ales ca director al Biroului de Arhive, Statistici și Cercetare la nivelul Bisericii Adventiste Mondiale, Conferința Generală. O personalitate cuceritoare, foarte deschisă și spontană, Dr. David Trim este un bun reprezentant al unei noi generații adventiste de înaltă pregătire academică, funcționând la fel de bine în instituții ale bisericii sau seculare, care discută istoria și perspectivele bisericii noastre într-un mod informat, obiectiv și loial. Dr. Trim, thank you very much for accepting my invitation. It's a pleasure. Thank you for inviting me to be with you. I mentioned already in the short Romanian introduction that many people, maybe they are not aware that the church may have an office for archives, statistics and uh, research. Uh, what is the reason for having uh, such such an office? It's a very good question and you know, Adrian, it's, it's only at the GC that such a bureau exists. Many, of course, departments at the General Conference exist at the lower levels yes. of the church. Uh, the reason it was established back in 1975 was because of a recognition that particularly archives and archive needed to be created. Up until 1973, all the General Conference's records had been kept separately in different departments. But this meant that if uh, an important matter came up, and church leaders wanted to know, well, how did we know this happened 10 years ago or 15 years ago? How to, how to produce yes. the, the material proof. Right, and so it was how do, we, how do we know what we actually did in response to this crisis or this sort of situation in the past and you sort of had to go around every department trying to find it. So in 1973, the GC actually decided to maintain an archivist. Uh, and in 1975, they brought together the archives with statistics. Now, statistics, there had been, he was called the statistical secretary since 1904. But actually, you can go all the way back to the Review and Herald, as it was then called, of 1864. There's an, a statistical report. So ever since the church was founded, we've been producing an annual statistical report. It wasn't always called that. It was sometimes called the statistical summary, but you know, we've always had one. Uh, and there was, I think, the recognition that the work being done under statistics, which includes the Seventh-day Adventist yearbook, but that work and the work of archives could profitably be brought together. And you know, on the face of it, I can imagine some of your viewers perhaps saying, what's the connection between archives and statistics. statistics and in many situations the answer might be but there isn't one but they have in the Adventist context they have something important which is that both of them enable better decision making by church leaders. Oh, we'll, we have to turn back to that because this is the most important thing and right. uh, the Adventist church of course is, is looking into the past we are based on history, we are based on events. We should be, we should so be. You know, yeah. Ellen White, one of her, the most quoted statements of Ellen White is, we have nothing to fear for the future except as so we shall forget the, the way the Lord has led us in our past. And his teaching, though, that's what it also includes. And people often just forget, will quote it as, except as we forget the way as Lord, the Lord has led. But it's the way the Lord has led and his teaching oh. in our past. And I highlight that because I think that brings out history. It's not just memory. Memory can be just, you know, well, we remember what has happened. But when you say, but we also need to know his teaching in our past, how do you establish what his teaching was? If you don't know what happened. Exactly. You have to. It, 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 to me, it's, it's talking about history, not just people's remembering. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, you know, but 
Though we quote that very often, Adrian, I don't know what it's like in Romania, but in most parts of the world church we quote it and then we don't do it. And very large parts of our past have actually have been forgotten. Mm -hmm. And you, you know, there's a saying, at least in English, that the past is another country. <laughs> uh, I don't know if that's, you know, very often English expressions you find in other languages as well, but I don't know about I, that. I was not aware of that, but uh, it makes sense. Well, because, you know, it's that sense that we don't, it, it's so strange sometimes we don't know, but it's also that we, we don't have the knowledge. And so when you go into the past, sometimes it is as though you were a tourist going to another country. Mm. Um, but if, if that metaphor, that analogy is correct, then large parts of our history will permanently be unexplored and undiscovered country because the records just don't survive. And without the, 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 the records of history, how can you know what happened? And so, you know, Adventism, I think, should be based on history because we know from our, our prophet that we need to look to our past for encouragement, but also to learn lessons. And yet I think so, you know, too often, perhaps, we haven't paid enough attention to our history. But I'm encouraged by the fact that you say that, uh, that, that, that we should. I, I agree with that. Um, but perhaps we, we need to do it even more. And of course, you know, in one way, Adrian, we, uh, we look forward to the imminent end of the yes. world and the second coming. And I think it's understandable that people say, well, if we're looking forward to this, why do we need to look back to the past? Mm -hmm. But we also know that the responsible thing as church leaders is always to, though we hope Christ comes very soon, you have to assume that he may not, and therefore you have to plan and act accordingly. And to be responsible. For and to be, re thank you. Yes, I think you described that well. It's, it's a degree of responsibility. And that includes taking care of our past records. Uh, and so, you know, all these things came together then in, in the mid-1970s with that recognition we can do we can do better at preserving our records, but also if we bring together our archives, our records of our institution, together with our statistics and the data that is in the yearbook, those three separate things, all of that provides a basis on which leaders can make better decisions. Now, they may not make better decisions, <laughs> that's up to them, but the least we can do is to give them the basis for it. And at least, you know, then they can be informed by understanding what is really happening in our church, with our membership, but also how we've encountered similar situations in the past. You know, I, I'm frustrated by how often one hears, people, one hears people say, this situation is unprecedented or it's unparalleled. And of course, sometimes there are truly unprecedented mm -hmm. situations, but I think most situations that arise actually do have some precedent. Uh, and it's, it's, it's useful to know how people, how the church has encountered that in the past. Um, even if we don't learn, even if there aren't lessons to be learned from it, at least we will know that if a member then comes up and says, why are you doing something differently to what you did 50 years ago? We won't be surprised and we'll, we'll have an answer and we can say, this is why we're doing something different. So for all sorts of reasons, you know, the, uh, the putting the archives and the statistics I th together, I think, was a good idea in the Seventh-day Adventist context. And uh, recently a third notion has been added, research. You have explained already uh, that it's not just uh, compiling data and right. uh, uh, you know, filling reports, or, uh, but also trying to understand the, the trends, the, the, yes. the connections, cause and effect, right. uh, and uh, the reasonings why they tried to do this. What was the result? Maybe we, we don't ask, were they sincere in doing that? Of course they are sincere, but was that the best course to, to follow? That's right. I, I think, you know, you, you, I agree, actually, that there will be some of perhaps your viewers who are a little cynical and jaded and, and may wonder about the sincerity. And I expect, you know, that because we're all humans, there have been some decisions made that were not taken from the best of motives. But that's very rare exceptions. On the whole, I think our church leaders have acted from the best intentions. Um, and, you know, again, an English expression, we say um, hindsight is perfect vision. Everything, when you look from the benefit of, of, of looking back, you can see everything perfectly. But that's not the case when you're in the present. We don't have that. Uh, and, but it's, it's, no, uh, it's no imputation of shame to look back and say, 
the decision our leaders took at this point was a mistaken one. And I'll give you an example. Yes, please. Um, from 1950 through to 1970, the work of our church in the Middle East, the Arabic and uh, Muslim world, was organized as a division, the Middle East division. And I mention this now partly because, of course, at this annual council that's just taking place as we record, yes. the church has decided to reorganize the work in the Middle East. But, you know, there was a time for 20 years when there was a, a division focused on the Middle East. But in the late 1960s, I think church leaders became a little frustrated with the rate of growth and probably didn't recognize that given the very particular situation in the Middle East with such a heavy uh, Muslim population and laws that make it very difficult to witness, probably didn't recognize that the rate of growth that was being experienced in the 1960s was probably rather good <laughs> for that area. But they were looking and perhaps comparing with parts of Africa uh, and South and Inter-America and saying, well, this is a little disappointing. At the same time, church leaders were faced with the issue of what to do with the work in Africa, which traditionally had been broken up and assigned to three divisions in Europe. Yes. Which, of course, fitted very well in the 1920s and 30s with ideas about empires and colonies. But by the 1960s, that world was, was gone, was already going and largely gone. And they realized, well, we can't have the work in Africa continuing to rely on leaders from Europe. We need to encourage local leaders. Uh, and so they, they had a wide-ranging plan to encourage n indigenous leadership across Africa, which just, you know, to, to go on a tangent briefly, we have to say has borne wonderful fruit because, of course, the leadership now across the world, we have, it's very rare that we have uh, Americans or Europeans leading the work outside those countries. A sure. hundred years ago, that was the norm. It's very rare. But as part of this wider package, they said, let's put East Africa with the Middle East. And the decision was very well intentioned. We know that because we can trace through the documents. We know the decision-making process. It was very well intentioned. And yet the effects actually were disastrous. And, you know, I say that it's, again, it's, it's easy to say that now. It wasn't plain to them then. But nevertheless, the effects were disastrous on mission. Putting the Middle East in with East Africa meant that resources which had been focused there were then went elsewhere. It wasn't good for East Africa. When in 20, 10 years later they recognized it was a problem, they put, created East Africa as more or less its own division and growth then, which had been very good, suddenly became incredible. So putting East Africa and the Middle East together wasn't good for East Africa. It certainly was disastrous for the Middle East. And in some ways, we've ne we have never recovered from that. Our membership has not recovered even today back to the point it was in 1970. Um, so that, you know, this, is, this is how leadership decisions can have an actual impact. The key is not to... Uh, not to condemn the leaders of the late 1960s for making those decisions, but to say, well, let's learn from them. And one of the points, for example, is that East Africa had nothing in common culturally with the Middle East, uh, except for you know, very small parts uh, which, which are Islamic and, and a strongly Arabic influence. Most of them had nothing in common linguistically, culturally, or religiously. And I think the decision probably made sense <laughs> looking from here in Washington, D.C. You've got, oh, the two regions are next door to each other. So, um, but that doesn't, you know, geographical proximity <laughs> doesn't mean that there's much in common. And for, you know, the biggest link historically between the Middle East and East Africa was slavery. That <laughs> Arab slavers took many hundreds of thousands of people of slaves from East Africa. So there was a gr great deal of suspicion. Just at every level, it didn't work. So, it was intended well, it was part of a wider package that worked in its other respects, but it had a disastrous effect. And so, we need to learn from that, and I think that's what the church is trying to do at the moment, and say, let's have the Middle East and all the Arabic countries as one region, not split, as they have been for the last 15 years, not put in with other regions of the world which they don't have anything in common, we'll say this will be the focus of one church organization. So th that's just an example of how it is possible uh, to go through records 
and learn some lessons that can be potentially very significant in their implications. Thank you for uh, opening you know, the, the territory uh, of our conversation, but uh, I'd like to change gears for a while and uh, turn to you as a person and uh, speak on your, your becoming uh, a historian, a statistician. Uh, if we were to look into your personal archives, <laughs> <laughs> what discoveries would you make <laughs> That's a, a very nice about your, <laughs> <laughs> your, your family of origin, your childhood, mm. uh, your interest, uh, interest as a child? I was, uh, my parents were missionaries. So when people ask me, where are you from? It's, it's not easy to give an answer which is very true, true of many um, missionaries' children, of course. It's not unique to me, but it is, it's, it's hard to sort of to give an explanation. But, In a uh, way, you, you, you anticipated the, the, the current growing situation <laughs> with people, you know, always on the move, the, yes. the, the third culture generation thing. That's, <laughs> yes, that's, 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 that's me in some respects. So? <laughs> but, you know, my parents are missionaries, uh, but my mother is English, my father is Australian. Um, my parents, my, my mother had gone to college in Australia, uh, even that's a long story, mm -hmm. but uh, she met my father there at Avondale College. Uh, they got married, they worked in Australia and New Zealand, uh, and then they were called to missionary service, and before the end, by, by the end of their active careers, they're, they're retired now and still active in some ways, but not active working for the church. They had also been missionaries in India and Thailand, as well as working in Australia, New Zealand, and Great Britain. Mm. So they worked in five separate countries. And you know, you said, talked about f foreshadowing the situation today. It's interesting, when they went from uh, New Zealand to India, they went by ship. Wow. And they were probably some of the last generation to do that, because even by the time they came to have their furlough, which was after five years in those days, they flew back to Australia for their, for their furlough. So uh, that's sort of just on the cusp of that, that major change that was brought about by the introduction of cheap international air travel. Yeah. Uh, so I was born in Bombay. My really? Two of my siblings, my two older sisters were born in Australia. Mm. My brother and a third sister were born in New Zealand. And then I was the youngest and um, it was something of a surprise to my parents. I'm quite a lot younger uh, than any of my siblings and my mother and father were both in their 40s. <laughs> um, so, uh, so you are born in India? I was born in Bombay or Mumbai as it's called nowadays. Do you have memories? I do, I do. Um, my parents and family moved uh, to Sydney in Australia when I was four. Oh. Uh, so I was very young, but I do have some memories. Um, you know, I particularly remember, it's interesting the things that stick yes. with one, uh, a swimming pool by the sea. Because of course India is very hot and uh, my mother would take my brother and sisters swimming sort of almost every day during summer. Uh, and I can remember uh, this swimming pool at a suburb called Breach Candy, which won't probably mean anything to any of your viewers, but maybe to some if they've been to India. And it's, it's actually by the Indian Ocean. Uh, and uh, I can remember that. And when I was 15, we went back to visit uh, Bombay. Oh. And I had wondered actually, was this really a memory or perhaps it was one, a slide or a photograph my parents took, but in, there's, that, that image isn't in any of their pictures and when I went back it's exactly as I remembered it or it was then, that was 26 years ago, but you know, looking out. Uh, so I, and I can also remember the mission compound where my uh, parents were stationed uh, in Mumbai, uh, just by a very large uh, park area, uh, what they call a maidan. Uh, which uh, in the summer will be covered by boys playing cricket, which is the, the most popular sport of India. Uh, so I, I, have a, I have a very few memories, um, and I think I have a couple of memories of, uh, of, uh, of people who worked there, including uh, a man called Pastor Mutaya, who dedicated me. And that was, uh, I think I was the first... Anglo-Saxon, European, American, or Australian baby <laughs> to be dedicated by an Indian pastor. Oh, interesting. So there had been some, you know, back in the 60s, there were still perhaps some attitudes still based on race, even in the church. And so, uh, but Pastor Mutaya was a great friend of my parents, and so he dedicated me. And uh, at the 1980 General Conference session in Dallas, my parents and I w attended, 
and uh, it was very nice to reconnect with him and uh, his family. He's since passed away. So, mm-hmm. anyway, so that's that. I, I grew up in uh, v- when I was very young in in Mumbai, and then moved to Sydney, and I was there uh, from f- just after age four till uh, age nineteen. So my formative years were very much in Australia, but I always was aware that I was uh, part British and was always and had visited England with my mother and father and was uh, I felt more of an affinity with Europe than with Australia to be honest interesting I don't quite know why that's the case it's just yeah. just is uh, do you do you remember when your interest for history began <laughs> That's a really good question, Adrian, and you know, it, I, I can't put a date yeah, on it, because yeah, yeah. it was just always there. Um, when I was very young, I was interested in archaeology. Really? Especially the archaeology of the Bible lands. Oh. And there's a very um, wonderful Adventist pastor and former missionary to India, David Down, who uh, went into archaeology very seriously, and probably even some of your viewers may have read things by him or seen a video series uh, Adventist, um, the church distributes some videos he's made about the archaeology of Bible lands. Mm. And uh, I can remember even when I was six, um, asking my parents that he was giving some public lectures in the Sydney Opera House. Oh, and I wanted to attend those. And I st- So consult- he was a very powerful... He was an excellent speaker and he had actually carried out excavations himself. Um, and my parents, as I said, had known them in India, but they too had gone back to Australia, and he'd acquired this interest, and he was a wonderful speaker, and I can still remember, even though it's uh, 35 years ago, some of his talk on the Hittites, and how the Hittites are mentioned in the Bible, but nothing was known of them until the late 19th yes. century, and people would say, wow, you know, this is an example of the fiction of the Old Testament, and then they, they, they were discovered by archaeologists, and we know that the Bible was completely right to talk about yeah. the Hittites. So I had that interest in archaeology, but somewhere, and I, when I was very young, I always wanted to be an archaeologist, but somewhere around the age 13, I realized that I didn't actually want to spend um, much of my life on my knees <laughs> with a brush dusting away dust from a small piece of pottery. Um, I'm glad people do it. No disrespect to archaeologists, but that wasn't what I wanted. I realized I was actually interested in writing about peoples and kingdoms and their developments rather than sort of discovering the the material remains of them and I realized that what I was really interested in was history not archaeology because you know history is one of those words that has many meanings and I suspect it's true uh, in in Romanian as well it can mean the past but it can also mean the study of the past so when I say I'm interested in history I mean it in both senses but you know I realized that rather than archaeology I was interested in the scholarly study of the past which typically is you will use material artifacts where they exist but is typically done from documents and the the records of what people thought and said at the time and not what they thought and said uh, many years later for example so on contemporary documents and so that was about 13 or 14 I realized that that's what I was interested in but you know I I don't want to take too much of your time on this but what I looking back what helped shape that interest was reading um, two books uh, about the Huguenots and the Huguenots of course were French Protestants who were much persecuted in the 16th and 17th centuries and Adventists will know about them because Ellen White was very interested in them and they have a significant section to themselves in the Great Controversy. Yes. Uh, and a very distinguished Seventh-day Adventist historian, a man called Walter C. Utt, uh, who was an expert on the Huguenots, did something extraordinary. He decided he would write historical novels for teenagers and children uh, about the Huguenots. And rather than writing scholarly books, he wrote these novels. Um, but that meant that he, was, he reached, of course, a far, far greater audience than if he'd written scholarly books, uh, including me. And um, mm-hmm. these are very well, you know, they, they capture the spirit of the time. You know, there were other things as well, but that was probably one of the key influences because I re- fir- read the first of those books, The Wrath of the King, it's called, about the king who started persecution of the Huguenots when I was very young and uh, so that 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 those were the things that directed my interest to the century and a half after the reformation which is my own particular 
main area of expertise is that uh, those 150 years uh, after Christendom was fragmented uh, by the Reformation. And I think, you know, if I, if I think about why am I interested in that period of history, it's partly because I've always been fascinated by the character of Oliver Cromwell, who was a great religious but also military leader of the Puritans in England, but also I think from that interest in the Huguenots and knowing that Ellen White in The Great Controversy was very interested in this period of history. And it's just all these things that one isn't even aware of at the time, but looking back, I can see those influences. Yeah. What can you say about uh, significant events or, or influences as far as faith is concerned? That's a very good question, um, and not one I actually think about very often. But, you know, I was raised by two wonderful Christian parents, and in fact, as I have, you know, become older, I, I've realized how much I owe to my parents because, you know, Australia in the early 1980s was, uh, could have been a very bad time to, and place to have been raised an Adventist because there were a lot of theological controversies in the church in general that they were particularly felt in Australia for various reasons. And yet I don't remember my local church being a, a terrible place to grow up at all. Though looking back, I know there was actual, that, those controversies were right there in that church as well as more generally. And I think my parents to some extent shielded me from that. And so I don't have, I have never had at all a negative impression of the church. Um, I was brought up without the, how can I say this, the, uh, the hang-ups that some Adventists have over righteousness by faith. Uh, that some go to one extreme and some to another. I feel that perhaps everyone feels this, that I'm in the, absolutely in the middle, <laughs> in the right <Yes>. place. <laughs> it's easy to say that, but, you know, I, I have just somehow <laughs> always never had any anxiety about that absolutely critical doctrine, which Ellen White, of course, says, is the third angel's message in verity. I've never, and, but why do I have that? It's not because of me, it's because of my parents, that I just grew up within a kind of, I understand this. Um, they grew me, they brought me up, I grew up, I should say, to, uh, to, to believe in orthodox, and I mean that with a small O, not the, yes. no, orthodox Christian belief, that is, you know, that uh, we are, that all the, the things that Christians ought to believe and so often today don't, that the Bible is the authoritative word of God, that God created the world, uh, that Christ was born of a virgin, in, you know, uh, from the Holy Spirit, that he lived, he died, he was resurrected and went back to heaven. All these things which are absolutely essential to, to Christianity, I, I was raised believing them, uh, and I still believe them absolutely. But I also was raised to, to know with certainty uh, that the Seventh-day Adventist Church was called by God into being for a special purpose. Was there a time when uh, your firm belief in the, in the basic uh, teachings of the Bible and the church. And your formation as a historian, uh, part of that, that training is to question mm. everything, to rely only on the documents and not on, you know, uh, yes. other kind of, of uh, information. And was the attention between the two of them? I think there is a tension, if we're honest, between uh, between scholarly academic history and Christian faith um, because uh, scholarly, not just history, but all scholarly pursuits yes. are about being critical. Yes. Uh, critical in the sense of questioning and, and, uh, and subjecting things to, to doubt. But, you know, there's a great um, Christian philosopher of the 12th century, Peter Abelard, who said, by questioning, we come to believe. And I do think that's true. And I think there are, if I think back to some of my friends when I was a child who are no longer in the faith, they were always brought up to accept our beliefs unquestioningly. And therefore, when they were shown even one area that seemed to be them to be at odds with, what, with our faith, hmm. the whole, you know, it's, it, it, you take one brick out in the hmm. wall and the entire house collapsed and it didn't need to. Hmm. And I think because I have... Uh, I have been questioning, my faith is stronger as a result. Now, that isn't to say that that will be the case for everyone. And, I, you know, I, I taught at Adventist colleges for 12 years. 
And I firmly believe that as teachers in Adventist institutions, we have to help our students through the process of questioning and doubt. I don't think we can say to them, just accept it because the church says so. For all sorts of reasons, it just doesn't work in practice, but all sorts of other reasons too. However, it's not enough. And I would say this, uh, looking back and being self-critical that I think Adventist academics perhaps at times are too good at telling Adventist young people to question and to doubt and not good enough at then saying, well, how can I move from beyond the doubt back to faith? And I, th I may have been a little guilty of that myself, but at some point I, I, I think I realized that. And I was always at pains, and I, I hope every Adventist scholar is always at pains when dealing with students to say, these are the problems, yes, they exist, but there are also reasons to believe. And these are the reasons that I believe. They may not they may not be reasons for you, but I believe, and these are the reasons I believe, and I want to share them with you. And I think then we can help um, our young people move through, not just young people, older people too, uh, any Adventist move through that process of saying, okay, there seem to be things that are at odds with, with science, but not just with science, but also with the way you know, history, historians and secular people understand the past, or with philosophy, or whatever it may be, yes, there are difficulties, but there are also reasons to believe. And so for me, I think being uh, an historian has strengthened my faith. I will say that Adrian, it's given me a different view of my faith than that that many Adventists may have, um, because I see things in a different context. But, um, you know, I am still absolutely 100% uh, certain that we serve a God who created us all, in the manner described in Genesis 1, that we work for a savior who died, who was born of a virgin, lived, died, resurrected, and went to heaven again, and that we in the Adventist church, though we know salvation isn't limited to people, people who are on our membership books, but we know that we were called into purpose, uh, but we were called into ex being by God with a purpose, and that we're still trying to serve that purpose. So in the end, um, my faith has not been been shaken I think it's been reinforced so this is a wonderful testimony you said that uh, sometimes or in some respects you see faith and uh, uh, church life uh, from a from a in a different context uh, does uh, that make you uh, to feel a little alienated from your brethren and sisters do you that's a very, you know, you're asking very shrewd questions here, Adrian. <laughs> very, very profound questions. Um, you should, should have warned me of them in advance. Um, I'm playing for time. Let me, to be honest, at times, yes, it does. Yes, it does. On the, but, you know, I, when I taught at Newbold College in England, because the church is so small in England, um, the faculty on, at Newbold will be, are asked to preach a lot. In the United States, you know, many pastors, many churches will have five or six pastors. <laughs> um, and uh, pastors are very often not very eager to share their, their pulpit. Yeah. Uh, but in, in England, it was sort of all, all hands to the pump, so to speak, another English <laughs> expression. Everyone had to help. Yeah. Uh, and so I preached a lot, and I would preach in very small churches uh, out in the country, where if you had 25 people attending, it was good. <laughs> you were doing well. <laughs> um, and... I always felt, and my wife would tell you this if you were to ask her, every time I left a church and we would return home, I would feel blessed by those people, sometimes quite simple faith. Uh, and I think there's a place both for a very simplistic faith, uh, but there's also place, a place for a more um, complex, nuanced uh, approach to faith as well. I think both of those are good and I think that's partly just because you know different people have different personality and you know th Martin Luther was told by the Catholic Church of his day he wasn't told actually that as we often say you have to save yourself because the Catholic Church never taught that but they said God wants you to do as much as you can and God will do the rest and Martin Luther was well how do I know if how do I know that I've done my best? How do I know that I've done the most that I can do? And that caused him immense spiritual a crisis. Um, but there would be other people who would be told, all you have to do is do your best and God will take care of the rest, who would say, great, that's wonderful. <laughs> um, 
you know, I know this from my own upbringing. My parents used to say to me about school or college, just do your best. That's all you can do. And I felt, oh, that's fine. Whereas, you know, one of my, uh, one of my siblings I, I recently discovered found that very traumatic because it was always, well, have I done the best I can? And, f and for him, it became a kind of a burden pushing him. Whereas for me, it was a kind of, oh, that's all right. So, you know, that, that's just a quick example of the way different people have different personalities. And so we each respond in different ways. But, you know, I'll also say, I think, in Scripture, we find both, you know, instructions from God simply, take me at my word. But you also find God saying, come, let us reason together. And we know from the uh, description of Mary that after the uh, after she hears about Jesus arguing with the rabbis in the temple, that she says she stored these things, you, you remember the text, she stored these things up in her heart, and the Greek word for that is that she, she thought she subjected them to analysis. Ooh. So God wants us, at times he wants us just to trust him and do as he says, and at times he actually, I think he wants us to question him. If you think of his response to Abraham uh, when he says, I'm going to destroy Sodom, when Abraham says, well, he bargains with God and God doesn't say, no, enough of that. God does bargain back with him. And in the end, actually, if you think about it, Abraham asks him to spare Sodom if there are even 10 righteous people there. And there aren't. But God doesn't destroy the, un even, the, even. the righteous. He's, he goes to special lengths to save Lot's yeah, family. Yeah. So, you know, God at times, I think, probably wants us to question him maybe more than we think. Mm -hmm. And I think, therefore, there's a place both for... Um, a very straightforward, simple approach to faith, and at times a more questioning approach. So you think the Adventist Church, at this time at least, is uh, large enough and uh, generous enough and uh, grown up enough to embrace people with different, uh, different backgrounds, different educational levels, but all of, may, maybe having different perceptions or thinking in different mm. contexts. However, all of them joining together uh, on, mm. on the basis of firmly believing that God has called this church with a special mission, not because we are better than others, but as a responsibility, he gave us a special mm. mission. Yes, I think I would agree with that completely. And I think, you know, it, it comes down to what are the essentials of our, of our faith? Uh, and perhaps at times we can divide ourselves and debate over things that are not absolutely essential. And I do think one problem in our church is that we spend too much time talking about the things we differ on and not enough time talking about the things we have in common. And actually, I think the overwhelming majority of Seventh-day Adventists agree on the overwhelming majority of, of things. And it's... Therefore, let's not spend the time talking about those few issues that we disagree about. Let's talk about the things we agree about. But I do think, too, that the church, as you nicely put it, is, is big enough now and is mature enough now to, to have room for different points of view. Though I also think, actually, that, that has been, that's been true for a long time in our church. Um, and if one goes back all the way to the late 1850s, when there isn't a Seventh-day Adventist church, you just have a community of Sabbatarian Adventists. Ellen White persuaded that embryonic group of believers to pay J.N. Andrews to research and write a scholarly history of the Sabbath, which is published as a history of the Sabbath and first day of the week, because she realized that there was a need to have intellectual scholarly arguments so that when Adventists went to people and said the day of the week has been changed and people would scoff at them, they could say, no, look, here's the evidence. And so they're actually paying John N. Andrews not to be a pastor and an and evangelist, but to do scholarly research and to write uh, because they realized there was a need for that. Now, that was admittedly an exceptional example from yes. our early history, but that shows that there's always been a recognition amongst us that one needs different approaches. Uh, and I think as the, the reason it was an exception is back then when the church was so small, there was a need for sort of everyone to be contributing to just one kind of work. As the church has grown larger and more substantial and spread over the world, you know, we've had to think about different things. So once our education was primarily to train workers and for the church, 
Uh, as the church has grown much larger, we've realized that we had a responsibility to our young people to educate them in a way that would inculcate Christian values. And so our education, while we still educate people to become pastors sure. and evangelists and accountants and so forth to work for the church, we also educate people to give them a thorough grounding in Christianity and in Seventh-day Adventist beliefs. Uh, so I think as the church has grown, different things have become more important. But I do think there's been, there's been scope for different avenues in Adventism for a very long time, and I think that's been one of our strengths. Uh, if I think of somebody like William A. Spicer, who was one of the two most important officers of the church for 29 years, he was Secretary of the General Conference from 1921 to 1922 and President from 1922 to 1930. And I would say more than any other one individual than Ellen White is responsible for our church being a truly worldwide, globe-spanning, missionary church because he was absolutely devoted to that. But Spicer was a very interesting man. Uh, he writes one article in the Review and Herald in which he describes how he's just been to uh, a service in an Anglican church in London, a Eucharist, uh, which will, I don't know what the word is, but I know in the Orthodox tradition in Romania, you'll be very familiar with that as well, a sung Eucharist where you celebrate the communion uh, with great ceremony and liturgical Liturgy. dignity and pomp. Uh, and why did he attend that? Because it filled a spiritual need for him. And he writes then, he, he concludes his article by talking about how, you know, the Church of England seems to be sliding into uh, embracing Catholicism and apostasy and the Adventist church is the true church. But he himself had a, a different sort of sensibility and liked a different style of worship. And he was also a phenomenally well-read and deeply educated man. Mm. And if you read his correspondence, which we have in our archives, he's interested in debating certain things. He writes a, a long, long letter to L. R. Conradi, who was president of the church in Europe. Yes. This is in 1915, saying, what do you think about the identity of the, the, the ten horns in the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation? Um, we've always said that one is this tribe, the Heruli, but I think it was the Lombards. And he cites a whole range of scholarly authorities for this. Now, <laughs> to some Adventists at the time and since, Querying which of the ten barbarian tribes with the, with the horns would be terrible apostasy. Um, I think, you know, we can say actually it's not the most, it doesn't change our relationship to Christ or sure. our belief in the third angel's message. I'm not saying it's unimportant, but it's not as important as other things. And I think that shows how even at the very top level of the church, somebody who was, um, had been very close to Ellen White, who knew the pioneers, who, was, you know, who is one of our, our great heroes, though he's now largely forgotten, uh, was willing to debate and read widely and question certain things which some of us would have regarded as being... The pillars. Yes, but, but you know, so that I think probably even more... This is a very long answer to your question, but probably even more now today than in the past, yes, we are open to that kind of... That, yes, we can have different approaches. We can disagree on some things, but so long as we agree, as you nicely said, you know, this is a special church that has a responsibility given by God to share certain truths, then we can put some of those differences aside. And yet I also think that that quality has been in there, there in Adventism right from the start. It may be more marked today. I would agree with that but I do think it's probably always been there, and that's one of our strengths. Hmm. Uh, as a historian, uh, I suppose you have devoured uh, every book, every article which was written about the Adventist Church, especially written by people from outside of our faith community. What is your perception? How is uh, our church and our movement presented? Uh, are, are we to, to fear uh, uh, when our, our church is looked upon mm. with the same eyes or with the same critical instruments as any other uh, society, any mm. other organization? That's a very good question. No, I mean, I, I truly believe those words of Alan. We have nothing to fear from our past. Mm. And I do regret that, you know, I've actually heard uh, some discussions about releasing documents in... in uh, 
uh, in which people say, well, of course we have nothing to fear, but <laughs> <laughs> they actually do think we have something mm -hmm. to fear. And I, I don't think we have anything to fear from the truth about our history. Um, though I do agree, you know, one has to be careful about how things are released and presented. Uh, but I think, you know, we, have, we particularly have nothing to fear from outside scrutiny. And I would actually, s I wish as a professional historian that more non-Adventists would write on Adventism. I actually why, why do you say that? Because I think their perspectives would be helpful. Now, we would disagree with them sometimes. Uh, and for example, uh, especially when people write on Ellen White, non-Adventists, of course, don't believe she's called and they therefore seek explanations for her visions and for the, her influence and phenomena that go beyond the, the leading of the Holy Spirit and God's power. Um, and yet I think uh, some scholars who have worked on Ellen White have highlighted very interesting things. Things which to some Adventists of course have shaken their but they also have highlighted things that put her in a new light and give us a new insight. So I think one just has to be aware when reading non-Adventist scholars that they will have a different purpose to us and it sounds obvious but you know if, 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 if you're not aware of it then it can be rather disconcerting. But I would wish that we did have more non-Adventist writing on Adventism because I think they would give us a different insight into ourselves, a different context. And I find it strange actually that you know, we are a very significant worldwide church um, of many millions now. We have the world's largest Protestant educational system, uh, probably the world's largest uh, parochial um, health system. We're actually, uh, we have very interesting beliefs. We're very apocalyptic and yet we make, we, we have no truck with the religious right in America even though we're evangelicals. Um, and this is something I found incidentally that non-Adventists very often assume that we are, well you're evangelicals, you must fit in with the religious right in America and actually we're very wary of them precisely because of our apocalyptic <laughs> understanding. Uh, and so you know we haven't been huge advocates for military aid to the nation of Israel, which is the case for many yes. political church, because we don't share that dispensationalist view of prophecy. So our prophecies actually feed into us in a very real way, and yet people who don't know very much will just sort of make very glaring mistakes. Uh, and so, you know, that, but those very points that we seem to fit in with a certain phenomenon in American society, but actually don't. Uh, the fact that we are engaged with religious liberty worldwide and have been champions for this in Europe, in Africa, in the Middle East and other parts of the world. Um, all these things actually make us rather interesting and I'm puzzled at the fact that we're not studied more by scholars from outside our faith tradition. So you feel there is kind of uh, neglect or isolation? I think there's an ignorance, ignorance. on the part of ignorance. wider scholars. Mm -hmm. um, which is perhaps a little bit fed by Adventist scholars who, you know, I, I hate to be critical of my fellow uh, Adventist historians, but I do think there's been too much of a tendency for people to feel, well, to demonstrate that I'm a good scholar, I have to attack my church. That's the mm. way I can demonstrate my bona fides, you know. Mm. I think there's been a little bit of a tendency of that and a little bit of a tendency to, on the other hand, to assume well, the wider world wouldn't be interested in us, we're so small. I've heard that a number of times. Mm, and actually I think, as I say, we, we're very interesting, even in those places where we're a minority. You're also a fellow of the Historical Society? The Royal Historical Ro Royal, Society. Royal, so yes. that's British. Yes. Uh, how do you interact uh, with, with other historians? How, how your Advent, Adventist faith yes. informs you? How, what opportunity do you, the opportunities do you have to to, no, to, to, make, to make that shine, yes. let's say, yes. maybe. No, that's uh, a good question. And uh, actually, it's, it's always been very easy, partly because I spent you know, 10 years teaching at Newbold College in Britain. And in America, it's very common to have small colleges. There are many hundreds of them, and many of them are religious. They're a very common phenomena. In Britain, that's very, and indeed Europe, yeah, yeah. As you know, that's, that's very unusual. Most universities are large universities yes, that are state states. or have a charter dating back to the Middle Ages. Uh, to have a small denominational college is very unusual. So whenever I, and I, I was always very e interested in going to conferences and seminars and so I did it a lot and it helped that Newbold is very close to London and Oxford. Yes. 
And so I've always actually, uh, I pride, I'm sort of proud of the fact that I, I have a very good uh, network of, of, uh, of experts on my period, especially the early modern period and to some extent now on Adventist history who, who are of all faiths and none. But what I found is attending conferences and seminars, people would always say, well, what is Newbold College? They'd never heard of it, usually. Um, and so they would ask, and that was a very good opportunity to say, well, it's a Seventh-day Adventist college, and I'm a Seventh-day Adventist myself. And then in Europe, very frequently people would say, well, what is a Seventh-day Adventist? Um, but even just, you know, I would, I know there are some of our people who would, who would never go to um, a pub or a bar. It's very common amongst academics after a, a scholarly paper to do that. And I would always do that, but I would, n I would never drink. Actually, my father worked in health and temperance work, uh -huh. and uh, I took the temperance pledge, which I don't know if you did. It's, it's sort of an old-fashioned thing. Not many people will have done it today, but I did that when I was, I think, 10 or 11, and I've always kept that. So even just the fact that I would never, never drink, people asked, you know, well, is that because of your religious convictions? And so, uh, you know, I didn't have to be terribly aggressive. People would, or, or pushing myself, people would ask me, and uh, I can't say that um, anyone has, that I'm aware of anyone who has been uh, won to Christ as a result. Mm. Uh, but on the other hand, I do know that I have at least made a witness to my faith among people who probably would never otherwise have heard of Seventh-day Adventists. And even just actually saying, yes, I'm a Christian in academia mm -hmm. is, um, is unusual. And at, even at a group in the Netherlands, I was at a conference of, of Christian historians and I spoke very openly about what I believed. And I had several come up afterwards and say to me, you know, even here, we very rarely talk about what I believe myself and how that has an impact on the way I do history. And they just appreciated the fact that I had been very open. And I've, I've had that opportunity in a couple of, in America as well. And so I feel, you know, I am letting my light shine. Uh, you have recently, r r r relatively recently, uh, started in this position uh, and uh, if I'm thinking on uh, some of your pre few because uh, the, this office doesn't have a very long life but I think uh, Donald Yost has been for, for how many years? He was the uh, yes he was the first director of archives and statistics and he was in office for 22 or 23 years uh, so that's I, a phenomenally I, long time yeah and you are still very young so it, it could be that uh, you, you may be here for a long time. Uh, I don't know. It's possible. Of course, it's, uh, the post has to be reappointed after every general conference session. That's so right. I serve on sufferance of my colleagues. Yeah. Uh, what, what is your dream? If you will be able to be here for five years or ten years or yes. whatever, what is your, your dream? What would you like to, to accomplish we, along with your small team? It's yes. a, very, a very, very small team. Yes. But you also have your you don't have your counterparts at uh, regional offices, but you, you can work with many other people. That's right. And I would see, and I th appreciate your question, I see uh, the Office of Archives, Statistics and Research at the General Conference serving best as a kind of nexus that can bring together all kinds of other things and allow, you know, bring into contact people who are working in different areas. Both people in the Secretariat, which is uh, division level, is whom I primarily work with the Secretariat staffs but also then at the union level, but then bringing in scholars from the various Adventist universities. And very often these two groups of people just don't interact. Um, mm -hmm. So that's, that's my, my first objective. Mm -hmm. The second would be to bring br greater honesty and accuracy to our membership statistics, um, which at the moment we have tended to report baptisms very accurately and not apostasies or those who've gone missing or even, or the even death. death yeah. And so I would like to see us move towards much greater openness honesty and transparency because you know God tells us you shall not bear false witness and mm -hmm. at the moment we are to some extent doing that but third coming to history which the archive side which is of course my passion um, I would like to promote a much greater knowledge of Seventh-day Adventist history and a lot more people doing Seventh-day Adventist history because you know it doesn't just have to be scholars every local church has its own history yes and where people have written the history of their local church, very often it's been inspiring and energizing for the, for the, per, the, per, the person and for the local church as a whole, especially because, you know, local churches can go through dips and upswings. And, and 
Very often people can say, oh, our glory years were 10 years ago, and at the moment we're not doing so well. And sometimes you can discover, actually, our best years were 40 years ago, and then we went through a downturn, and then we had what we thought were, you know. And just knowing that can encourage people, I think. So, you know, I'd like to encourage people at every level to become interested in their history of the Adventist church, but I'd also hope that the church and its institutions would put more resources into it because we do have nothing to fear yes. so long as we don't forget. Uh, do you think your office will be able to put together some, some, uh, some published books? That's Not, my, be, yes. Besides the, the required statistical The yearbook reports, and the annual statistical yeah, report, yeah. yes. My hope is that we could move towards a, uh, a scholarly journal on Adventist history and what is known as Adventist studies because none exists. There is nothing. There like is that. nothing. And you know, if you wanted, if you were a Methodist or a Baptist or a Presbyterian or a Congregationalist, they all have historical societies that produce scholarly journals. I think Adventism, we need it now if we're to know ourselves. Thank you, uh, the, uh, Dr. Trim. Uh, it was a fascinating conversation and I can't wait to invite you another, at another time, either here or maybe at one time you'll visit Romania and maybe there we'll have more time in our own studios to discuss uh, issues like that and how, how this work uh, is, continues, uh, is uh, continuing to grow and to expand. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. Historia, historia personală, historia bisericii, historia națiunilor, ce câmp de studiu pasionant! Aduceți-vă aminte, ne spune Dumnezeu. Cercetați-vă căile, ne spun profeții. Construiți un viitor mai bun, ne invită Mântuitorul. Vă mulțumesc pentru interesul cu care ați urmărit conversația cu dr. David Trim, directorul Biroului de Arhive, Statistici și Cercetare pentru Biserica Adventistă, Conferința Generală. Vă aștept la o nouă ediție a emisiunii Punctul de Plecare, de fapt la un nou punct de plecare pentru o viață curajoasă, creativă și generoasă. La revedere!